Well, as you know, we are continuing this series through our souls being at war. We're declaring no surrender, no retreat, absolutely no way. And this weekend, as we continue in that vein, I want to call your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. Verses 1 through 6 make up the context for our sermonic time together. But for the purposes of preaching, I just want to look at verses 3, 4, and 5. This is how the Bible reads. It says, for though we, wake, for though we rather live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. For the weapons that we fight with not of weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that, set, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive, everybody shout, take captive. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul says the weapons that we fight with are not of the world. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. This weekend, I want to preach using as a subject, I'm stronger than the stronghold. I'm stronger than the stronghold. Ladies and gentlemen, in the fall of 2018, Sotheby's that famed and renowned auction house in London, England, had an auction, and at the auction they were uh, auctioning off a painting entitled Girl with Red Balloon, wrapped in a golden gilded edged frame. This black and white photo that was hanging on display was considered one of the more popular paintings that was on auction that night. There were a few people who were committed. They wanted to have it. Pastor Clark, as people sipped champagne and nibbled on caviar, the painting went up on auction and was sold to an anonymous bidder for $1.4 million. And at the moment that the auctioneer banged the gavel, I want you to see what happens next. <laughs> Did you see it? Friend, inside of this beautiful golden gilded edge frame was a shredder that was placed there by the artist and he had arranged for the button to be pushed and the shredder to be activated and caused the canvas, once it was sold, to come through the frame and demolish itself. If you notice toward the end of the video, the security guards came rushing in to take the painting away. But what's interesting here is that having security guards to take paintings away are not necessarily uncommon. But often, security is there for the express purposes of keeping the painting away from the people. But what do you do when the painting needs protecting? Friend, though beautiful on the outside, there was something inside of it that was designed to bring about its own demise. Friends, isn't it true? I know you say sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, you say for real. But isn't it true that on far too many occasions we are like that painting and we tend to get in our own way? The reality for many of us in this room is that sometimes in the battle for our spiritual life, the number one en enemy that we have to conquer is not necessarily the inner me, but the inner me. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 7 when he said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do are the things that I know I ain't supposed to do. You know the stuff that I promised God that if you get me out of it, I'd never go back to it again. That's what I find myself like a dog returning to his vomit doing again. 
Because for some sick, twisted, and trifling reason, when I try to do good, evil shows up. So what Paul labels in the text a stronghold. It's a deeply entrenched or deeply embedded approach to life that is sabotaging the life that God has for you. One theologian put it this way. It's a mindset that is impregnated with hopelessness that causes us to accept something that we know runs counter to the will of God for our lives. Strongholds, friends, are those firmly held false belief systems that hold us back from living a life of freedom and fulfillment in Christ. It's those stubborn, irrational, seemingly in, in, uncontrollable and counterproductive value systems and thought processes. Those ideologies that arise up in us that we know stand contrary to the truth of scripture and frankly is stunning your growth in God. You'd never admit it publicly. But here's what I know. All of us got a stronghold. Fear is a stronghold. Doubt and confusion is a stronghold. Feelings of inferiority and insecurity are strongholds. Unforgiveness and distrust are strongholds. Apathy and addiction, worry, rejection, and negativity. All of these things and so many more have been designed by the devil to frustrate us and obstruct the progress of the gospel. We all got one. Doesn't matter how beautiful and well put together we look on the outside. There's something intrinsically inside of all of us that is prone to sabotage the valuable prize that God has placed within us like that painting. We look well put together on the outside, but inside of each of us is a shredder. It's capable of destroying the most valuable and vital parts of our existence. And it constantly leaves you and me with these tattered pieces of joy. These tattered pieces of peace and tattered pieces of God-sized fulfillment. And we wonder if this is how the Christian life is expected to be experienced. All of us got one. I can tell some of you, you're still trying to wrestle with whether or not you got one. So here's... Maybe something that I want you to consider. When we talk about strongholds, understand we're not just talking about a cycle of sin. You see, for some of us, we assume that this sermon ain't for us. Because you've been walking with the Lord for a little while and you can testify the things you used to do, you don't do as much. You've experienced a few spiritual victories in your life. But understand, friends, when we talk about strongholds, you and I have to realize and recognize that strongholds do include include, rather struggles to overcome certain sin cycles. But it's more than a cycle or a season of sin. For some of us, this is something that is more subtle on the surface. But if you don't deal with it, it's going to become more sinister to your soul. If you don't think I'm talking to you, let me see if I can ask you a few questions. What's the one thing right now that's holding you back from enjoying all of the abundant life that Jesus promised and provided? What's causing you in your life to feel stuck? What what part of your life, friends, have you just learned to live with? What have you allowed to box you in and close others out? What system, schemes, structures, and life strategies have you allowed Satan to set in your mind or in your emotions that cause you to continue to sabotage your own spiritual success? Whatever that is, friends, that is the stronghold. But the good news is God has given you and I everything that we need to stand strong Against the stronghold. I came to declare to somebody in this room this weekend that you ain't got to stay trapped in the stronghold. Because strongholds were never meant to have a stronghold on believers. Here's how I know because Paul says that the weapons that we fight with possess a divine power. Somebody shout power. They possess a divine power and they have been designed to accomplish one defining purpose. And that purpose, friends, is to demolish or to pull down a stronghold. And the text 
Paul, of course, is primarily talking about arguments against arguments against or heresies regarding the Christian faith. In fact, at the time of the text, Pastor Clark, you would know that Paul here is defending his ministry to the church at Corinth, a church he planted. He's their spiritual overseer, but he's having to prove whether or not he's worthy to be their pastor. And the reason why is because there are some false teachers, some Judaizers, who had infiltrated the church trying to diminish and discredit Paul's authenticity as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to remember Paul was saved by the Lord. God has been using him to this point to spread the gospel to much of the known free world. It has come out of Jerusalem and it is literally going around the world. People are getting saved. Churches are being planted and they are growing. But there were some teachers, some super spiritual people who had come into the church and began to sow discord amongst the believers because they said, surely if God was going to use somebody to push his kingdom agenda forward, He picked somebody with a little bit more oomph. He picked somebody that was a little bit more special. They said Paul couldn't be an apostle. He can't be the one God chose to push the kingdom agenda forward because he ain't got the right credentials. He wasn't ordained in this church. No, God can't use Paul because he wasn't all that impressive. They said that Paul, though he was courageous in the letters that he wrote, when you came close to him, he he was a little bit weak and timid. They claimed that his motives were impure. And in effect, they were suggesting here that when you look at Paul, Paul was all bark and no bite. And so Paul says, listen, I got to clap back at these teachers. Because this is my church. This is the church that God used me to plant. And what's significant about the church at Corinth is that this was a church that had it going on. From the outside looking in, you would think that everybody who was a part of this church was good with God. It was a financially stable church. They were growing. They had every single spiritual gift fully active and alive in the life of the church. They prophesied, and it came true. They they, they spoke in other tongues, and they had somebody on the other side who could interpret The preaching was A1. The Holy Ghost was using them to glorify God and edify the people. Things on the outside, much like many churches in America, look like everything is going well, but internally the people were a mess. In fact, when you study the life of the church at Corinth, when you read 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you realize that all of these challenges could be summed up by this one notion that they were spiritually immature. And because of their immaturity, the enemy was able to infiltrate the church in hopes that he would be able to neutralize the impact of the church in the city of Corinth and minimize the spread of the gospel. And this is why we're talking about it on this Sunday morning to those of you who have made your way to 4301 Tannehill because on the outside we look real good. But there's some territory that God wants us to go and get. And it's not enough for a few of us to go possess it. All of us have to be in the best spiritual shape that we can be to pursue all that God has, not only for our lives personally, but for what God wants to do in and through this ministry here at this church. I highlight this simply because it's a reminder to all of us that it's easy for us to not assume that we don't have a stronghold, but we fail to forget, because we fail to forget rather that though we are saved, it's still possible for us to still be enslaved. You do realize there's a difference between salvation and liberation, don't you? You see, you can be saved from your sins, but not live in total and complete freedom. Let me see if I can give it to you this way. Anybody order anything from Amazon this week? Did you pay your tithes? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so, 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 so for those of you who have ever ordered from Amazon, I want you to think about the last thing that you purchased. And I'm almost confident this is how it went. You saw something you wanted. You made the transaction. But you had to wait for it to be delivered to you. And so technically, the moment you purchased what you purchased, it was yours. But until it was in your possession, you don't benefit fully, watch this, from what's already yours. Why? Because it hadn't been 
delivered yet. Friends, on a higher, holier, and heavier level, this is where many of us are right now. We are glad to be saved. We are glad that when we put our trust in Jesus, there was a transaction that purchased our salvation. Our sin debt has been paid. But the truth is, for some of us, we hadn't fully arrived yet because we hadn't fully been delivered yet. And this is what Paul is inviting us to do. It's what the children of Israel, since we're teaching during this series, this is what the children of Israel teach us. You remember the Passover, don't you? The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 12 that when God had finally gotten tired of Pharaoh, after nine of the plagues, nine other warnings to let God's people go and walk, allow them rather to walk in freedom and pursue everything that God had for them. The Bible says that God told Moses and Aaron to tell the children of Israel that the death angel was about to sweep through Egypt. God was about to kill the firstborn of everything in Egypt. But God says, listen, because you my people, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a young goat, kill that goat, take some, take some blood from that goat and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of your houses. Don't, and everybody uh, who's in the house stays in the house. Nobody leaves outside of the house because when I pass through, I'm going to pass judgment and bring judgment up on is, Egypt. rather. But the blood, I went by that way too fast. I said the blood will be a sign for you so that when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no destructive plague will touch you when I come through Egypt. This ain't really in my notes. I mean, it kind of is a little bit. But I wonder, is there anybody who can pause and help me praise God for the blood? That reaches to the highest mountains and flows to the lowest valleys. That blood that gives us strength to demolish strongholds from day to day. That will never lose its power. I'm moving, but the only reason I highlight this is because that night when the Israelites applied blood to the doorposts, Don Walker, they were saved. But they were still in Egypt. They were saved, but they were still enslaved. And the same is true for you and I as well. Because of the blood of Jesus, we give God praise that we are saved. But just because you are saved, that doesn't mean you automatically are free from dealing with strongholds. And so God says, listen, here's what I need you to do. I need you to deal with the stronghold because my goal for your life is not just so that you could escape hell, but I want you to enter into the abundant life that I have for you here on earth. Hear me, friends. The goal for for this Christian life ain't just salvation. It's salvation and liberation. He says it's not enough for you just to walk in forgiveness. I want you to walk in freedom. And so you and I have to deal with the stronghold. And so the question then becomes how do we begin to evict these strongholds? How do we know that we are stronger than our strongholds? Well, let me give you, if you don't hear nothing else I say, I need you to hear this. Let me start by saying very succinctly that we do not try to be stronger than the stronghold in our own strength. Friend, a stronghold ain't going to go away just because you're trying hard. It's not going to go away just because you work at being a better person. You need something more. We need something more. And I want to submit to us this weekend, a church, in very practical ways. You and I can live stronger than the stronghold when you and I are able to recognize that our strength is found in the support of others. We gain strength to be stronger than the stronghold through the support of others. Hear me, friends. You've heard this throughout the entire series. I'm just reiterating what you already hear, and I just want to put new language on it. There's strength in numbers. Often on our journey toward freedom and deliverance, we try to travel alone. But understand, friends, if you and I 
are going to walk in freedom and forgiveness simultaneously. We need the help of others. We should not be traveling alone. We need other people to help us and to guide us because you and I cannot do this by ourselves. And so if you plan on getting free and if you plan on staying free, you got to maintain a commitment to Christian fellowship. Emphasis on Christian. Did you catch your emphasis on Christian? And here's why. Because one of the tricks of the enemy is to keep people isolated and removed from those who can help bring about the freedom in our lives. He uses these invisible, imaginary, irrational, impregnable walls in our thoughts that make us feel like we can't trust nobody. That nobody has gone through what I have gone through. And what we fail to realize is that the very people that the enemy is trying to keep away from us may be the very ones that are holding the key to our next level of deliverance. And this is why you and I need a community of people. As Pastor Clark said on last week, outside of your mama and them. Because this fight is too big to fight by yourself. Unfortunately, this is one of the great challenges of our current church culture. By church, I mean Big C Church, global church. Many of us have embraced the philosophy of the culture. I'm going to roll one deep. I can do bad by myself. And for some of us, that's exactly what's happening. You're doing bad. (laughs) Help me, Holy Ghost. All by yourself. This is why the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 24 and 25. You and I ought to consider, uh, must always rather consider, be considering rather one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing but exhorting and encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Many of you, 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 like me, like watching National Geographic. And a few weeks ago, I was watching a show in the middle of the night trying to put myself to sleep. And um, I, I was watching how lions hunt their prey. And one thing I noticed is that whenever the lion was determining who he was going to devour, he never tried to attack the herd. Why? He, he, he was always targeting the one was being dragged away. Watch this by their own desires. They drifted away from the herd and didn't even realize it because they were just off doing their own thing. This is why Peter says, friends, you and I have to be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. What Peter's saying here, friends, is in no uncertain terms, church, He's saying to us, rather, church, I want you to be as serious about this spiritual warfare as Satan is. And Satan is so serious about your soul. And so you and I have to be vigilant. We got to make sure that he's not more serious about our souls than we are. One of the ways, friends, that you and I can guarantee not being, or one of the ways, rather, that we can guarantee being devoured is when you and I begin to pull away from the foe. When life starts lifing, that ain't the time for you to pull back. That's the time for you to dig in. Because as long as you are away from meaningful, life-giving, symbiotic relationships with, watch this, other sinners who sin just like you, but who are the beneficiary of God's grace, you're going to continue to be a uh, 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 you're, you're going to be continue rather to be a target of prey for the enemy. Friend, we all need somebody. Somebody say, I need somebody. And while I'm here, can I just add the kind of people that you need? You need more than your brunch buddies. You need more <laughs> than you, I was going to say spirit, but some of us are graduated to spirit. You need more than your Southwest Airline sisters. 
You need somebody. We need somebody to push us forward. And some of us uh, need somebody, rather, to pull us back because we always on ready. We need somebody to encourage us and inspire us to tell us what we need to know and tell us what we don't want to hear. Who ain't afraid to uh, call you out when you've been wrong and be a listening ear when you've been done wrong. We all need somebody who we may not like what they say, but we trust what they say because they love us enough not to lie to us when they see us going through what we're going through. Because I've embraced as a philosophy of life that my life will be the result of the sum total of the books that I've read and the people that I choose to hang around. Brother Gregory Lane, I, I want to submit that I, I look at often my relationships this way. I'm, I'm, many of you may have, may have heard this, and this is something that I've tried to do and, and am trying to do with my life. Though imperfectly, this is something that I aim for. But I look at my relationships this way, First Lady. Everybody needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. If you don't get nothing else in terms of friendship, you need a Paul. A Paul is a mentor. Somebody who can help you going out a little bit further ahead of you. And have seen where you are and have been where you are and can help you to navigate by answering the tough questions in your life so that you can be the best that God has called you to be. Everybody need a mentor. Everybody needs a Paul, but everybody needs a Barnabas too. Barnabas, when you read the New Testament, was known as the encourager. He was Paul's companion. Before there was Paul and Silas, there was Paul and and in the same way, we need a brother or a sister who ain't scared to stand with us through the thick and the thin. We need somebody who will stand with us and, are, and, and stand alongside us when we go forward in life. Somebody who ain't afraid to take a bullet for you. You need somebody who is your equal. But you also need a Timothy. You see, Paul had a Timothy. A Timothy was somebody who you're pouring into. And so as you benefit from the wisdom of your Paul and you get encouraged and inspired by your Barnabas, you realize that God didn't give you these people just so that you can keep this stuff to yourself. No, there's another generation coming up behind you who's going to have to benefit from God, what God is doing in your life. Hezekiah Walker put it this way, I need you, you need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me, we're all a part of God's body. Why? Because it's his will that every need be supplied. And he's going to supply it through other people. This is why you and I have to be important to one another and we need each other to survive. Here's the next thing. Strength is found. Not only when we surround ourselves with the support of others, but strength is found when we are soaked in the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that makes strongholds so strong is that they are built upon deception and lies that we've accepted in our minds and our emotions. And so the question becomes, how do you counter a lie? Well, it's easy. You counter the lie with the truth. And the question becomes, for believers, where is truth found? In the word of God. Absolutely. That, that's why Paul says here that the weapons of our warfare are, where warfare are not carnal. In other words, they are not from the flesh. Which means that the only way to win the battle against the enemy is to remember that when it comes to how we think, and in particular, how we regulate our thoughts, you and I have to learn how to compare everything. Somebody shout everything. You got to compare every thought, every word, every deed and see if it lines up with the word of God. And if it falls below the standard of what the word of God says, you and I have to immediately pull it down. In other words, that means you and I have to come to a point where we believe that the word of God, and this is what some of us, this is really the work we got to do. We actually got to believe that the word of God is strong and sufficient, adequate and apt enough to surrender your life to. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that God uses other ways to help people to make progress. I am a proponent of therapy. You've heard me say this. I believe you can have the- theology and a therapist. But hear me and hear me well, friends. When it comes to overcoming certain strongholds, don't ever get it twisted. It's the word of God. It's the living, breathing, moving word of God that is the key to change because transformation happens at the word. True deliverance takes place in the word. A clear understanding of who God is and who we are can only take place when we align ourselves to the word of God. That's why Paul says, I don't want you to be confused form to this world with all of its deceptive half truths but I need you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind because it is only then that you and I will be able to discover and decipher what God's will is his good pleasing and perfect will why because man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God I want to suggest That what God is inviting you and I to do this weekend is to do what many of us do when we wash dishes. Some of us know that when we cook, there are some things that stick to the bottom of the pan. Watch this. And no matter how much you try to scrub it, it ain't going nowhere. No matter how much elbow grease you put in that thing, it's... It's going to be there. It's so stubborn that you need some additional assistance. You need, watch this, some extra strength. And so here's what you do, isn't it? You put some water in the sink. Put a little dishwashing liquid in that water and let that pot, mm mm-hmm. And I don't understand how it works, but here's what I know to be true. There is something about the soapy water that allows the ability to soften the most hardened and stubborn food that's stuck on there. And what God is saying to you and I this weekend is we've got to soak in the waters of the word. We've got to soak in his promises so that when problems arise that never seem to go away and when discouragement and frustration and irritation begin to set in, we ain't got to go to no Facebook prophet, no Instagram intercessor, or no TikTok theologian to find a word because we are already inundated and overwhelmed by the word of God. And God says, for some of you, the reason why you're still struggling with certain strongholds, friends, is because you ain't been sitting long enough in my word and allowing the water of the word to do what you cannot do with your best efforts. You got to soak. Unless some of that stuff just just come off you. Here's the last thing. I'm done. This text teaches us that strength is found in the support of others. Strength is found over strongholds when we soak in the scriptures. But here's the last thing. Strength is found when we are saturated in the spirit. Friend, the word of God is very clear. Trying to control your flesh by yourself is like trying to take the tail of a rattlesnake and tame it. The great likelihood is you may be successful for a little bit, but it's only a matter of time for that thing to turn around and... Friend, that's why so many of us are experiencing failure constantly. This is why many of us continue to self-sabotage our own selves and our own spiritual success because we're trying to fight the devil without the Holy Ghost. I tell you, you and I need the power of the Holy Ghost. I don't care how much willpower you have, willpower alone ain't going to get it done. We need the Holy Ghost. I, I hadn't asked you to touch your neighbor yet. Would you look at somebody near you and tell them for the first time, hey, you need the Holy Ghost. 
Wish I had somebody who would grab this word right here because the reality for somebody here is that right now in your life, you've been trying to accomplish God-sized goals in the flesh. You've been trying to do godly things in your own strength and with your own ingenuity and with your own connections and charisma and in your own power. Don't get it twisted. I understand that you are smart and I know you got connections all over the city. I know you a big baller, shot caller, but can I tell you if you expect to be any threat against the enemy, enemy them connections ain't gonna really matter to the enemy because the great likelihood is those connections are still at times being influenced by the enemy which is a whole nother conversation for a whole nother day and so if you and I are gonna walk in freedom and forgiveness we gonna need power from a different source I, I, I promise you I was trying not to go this far but my soul is starting to catch on fire I'm trying to figure out which way I'm gonna go look at somebody and tell them you need to be saturated in the Holy Ghost because what cannot be done by willpower will only be accomplished by his real power listen what you and I cannot do in our own willpower God can accomplish with his real power God says to somebody here here's why you needed to come to 4301 today because I needed to tell you that the help you need if you saved you already got it the help you need to accomplish what God is willing uh, and working in your life can only be accomplished through the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost so what stronghold you facing this weekend is it anger, wrath, jealousy, a sexual sin, feelings of inadequacy, worthlessness, or insignificance? I don't really know what it is. And the truth of the matter is, if you heard what I said to you over the last 40 minutes or so, it really don't matter what it is. Because the good news of the sermon is this. You and I don't have to struggle in the same ways that we used to struggle. And we don't have to let what's been holding us back continue to hold us down. You've got some help. Would you look at somebody for the second time and tell them you've got help. You've got help. You don't have to do this by yourself. You ain't got to carry this by yourself. You ain't got to trigger, figure this out rather by yourself. You've got help from the Holy Ghost. And because you got help from the Holy Ghost, my soul is catching on fire and I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. Because you got help from the Holy Ghost, you are stronger than the stronghold. I'm done for the weekend, but I know the mindset, that negative approach to life has been hampering you in the past, but you're stronger than the stronghold. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Would you help me? I'm going there. I feel it. Okay. Uh, would you help me encourage somebody and tell them you're strong stronger than the stronghold you're stronger than your fears you're stronger than your addiction you're stronger than the generational curse on your family you've got a God who has made you strong and mighty because he's put the same power that raised Jesus from the dead on the inside of you and I know you're struggling now because all you think about are the mistakes that you made in your past but can I encourage somebody and tell them you're stronger than your mistakes you are stronger than your misfortune you are stronger than the season that you mismanage you are not your past you are not what you did because you've got the Holy Ghost living inside of you and because you got the Holy Ghost living on the inside of you you are who God says that you are which means you're free and forgiven you're rescued and redeemed you're regal and righteous you're saved and sanctified you're chosen and called you're enlightened and empowered because you got the power of God living on the inside of you and the last time I checked greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world come on help me close the sermon look at somebody and tell them thank God for the Holy Ghost what is this that makes me feel this way what is this that keeps me acting this way whatever it it's making me stronger than the stronghold and if you're grateful for the power of the Holy Ghost already in you give him praise because you ain't got to go look for it it's already in you
you. So tap into the power and walk in the freedom that God has given you. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Stand your feet all over the church. We're going home. I want to pray. I want to pray. And I want to pray on a couple of areas. I want to pray. Some of us. That God would grant us the courage. To actually name the stronghold. Because I can look across your face. The whole sermon you were trying to figure out which one is it. I want you to wrestle with it. I want you to actually call it out. Because sometimes the reason why we struggle, Pastor Clark, is because we have yet to name the challenge. And you and I, God says, cannot be afraid to call it out. I, I, I don't even know if it's possible to say that um, there's an advantage to being an addict. But if there was, it's this. They have, an addic they have an addiction that they can identify. Whether it's alcoholism, gambling, drugs, overeating, whatever it is, the one advantage to addictions when it comes to overcoming is that they know what it is. God says for some of us, the reason why the stronghold has such a stronghold on us is because we have yet to specifically call out what it is. You, you, you've been calling it compassion. It's a savior complex. Are you getting what I'm saying? We try to call it every other thing except for what it really is because if we call it out, we got to admit that we struggle and many of us, we don't like to admit that. So for somebody here, I want to invite you to call it out. And then there are others of us, we just need the courage to actually, we know what it is, but to actually deal with it. And so in this moment, you can play that. I think that's perfect. In this moment, I want to invite you in your own way to take a moment and whether you need the courage to call it out, in fact, I want you to call it out in your own soul. And if you feel encouraged or empowered to do so, ain't no, all of us got one. So if we hear what yours is, we probably going to say amen because we got the same one. <laughs> but I want us to take a moment in this spirit of worship with the information you know now. The power that you already have on the inside of you. If you need to name it, I want to invite you to take time to name it and ask God to give you the courage to face it. And for those of us who we know what it is, let's ask God to give us wisdom to embrace the reality that we are stronger than the stronghold, but we're going to have to deal with it if we're going to walk in freedom for real. And so all over the room, in your own way, whatever posture you want to take, let's begin to pray even now. There no way I can go hear you church come on let's lift the sound of prayer in the house let's lift it
finish praying. There's no other way. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for this word. We know you spoke to us. And you gave us specificity. I pray very simply that you would renew our minds. The water of the word that you would give us the courage to take the next step if it's necessary to enfold and make ourselves available to be enfolded in relationships that are meaningful and life-giving and symbiotic. And I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit for somebody here that the next time they talk about their struggle, they will name it, knowing that often you can't fight what you don't face and so father I pray that wherever my brothers and sisters land in this worship experience as a result of this word God that you would by your spirit's power give us the courage to take the next step because this Christian life is not meant just to be a life of forgiveness it's supposed to be forgiveness and freedom and so we pull down whatever strong imaginations in our mind keep us from walking in that freedom in Jesus name and all of God's children said together amen come on everybody let's sing it one time if you know it but there is no other way is no other way is no other way come on let's pump it one time we, we not leaving yet we ain't leaving we ain't leaving we ain't leaving give me a minute Everybody, let's clap our hands. Aren't you glad you came to church on today? Come on, let's, let's honor what God did through Pastor Vicente Coltman, our assistant pastor here at Greater Mount Zion. So if you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, never made him your leader, never decided to cross the line of faith, I want you to do that on today. Here's the way we do it. We're going to close in prayer in a few minutes. And immediately after we close in prayer, I want you to go from where you are, exit this door right here. Kevin, why don't you wave your hand? This is Kevin Enders. There's a room, 145. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take you into that room. and We're going to pray the prayer in which you're going to be able to grab eternity. God is going to save you. He's going to save you. If you pray that prayer on today in faith, because the greatest stronghold is the stronghold that keeps me from making Jesus my leader. That's the, that's the biggest one. And so we want you to overcome that stronghold, and then that, that paves the way to overcoming other 